Welcome to Baymore Stables Presents Chatter at the Bit. Well, today I'm going to cover, for some reason, a very controversial subject, which I'm not quite sure why, is barn and pasture, shelters, whatever, housing your horses, looking after them. And for some reason, people have it set in their minds what is required. And that baffles me because required uh for horses you're required to make them safe make them happy and look after them how you choose to do that that's on you so i'm not quite sure so hopefully i can clarify a few things and probably piss a few people off but that's all good first thing i'm going to cover is pasture now ministry of agriculture for years has always indicated it is one acre per animal unit for pasture now, that could be one horse, one goat, one chicken. It's one animal unit per, per, per acre. And I, it gives you a guideline. It's not really set in stone. It gives you a guideline that if you are running horses on pasture, then this is your guideline. So if you have two horses, two acres. I personally, I have my herd of broodmares. I got nine of them on 12 acres. I would love to have 50 broodmares on 100 acres, but the Gregor says no. <laughs> so pasture, it's you want a nice pasture for your horse that's not heavy. People seem to think, oh, well, I'll put lots of clover and lots of timothy and into their pasture. That is not what you want to do um, because it's a heavy grass and it is meant to be foraged for hay. You want a nice pasture mix. You want a fescue. You want maybe a touch of timothy. You want something that's going to provide substance but not overload leading to founder. So you kind of, you want something a bit in, in fact, go to your feed store. They're absolutely fantastic. It is Go to your feed store and say, I'd like a nice pasture mix. They have them. They have special pasture mixes of seed made up for horses, cows, or whatever. And go with that. Don't go with you need, you know, high clover, high white clover, orchard grass. You don't need that heavy. So when you're going on pasture, you want to realize, you want to take into consideration really that horses graze 23 hours a day. So doesn't matter if they're not getting their nutrient balance out of their grazing. They're grazing animals. That's what they do. So it, it you can have grass, It's but you have to supplement. I am not a believer. Back 50 years ago, yeah, you could throw a mountain pasture and away you go. Everything was good. In this day and age, you have to supplement. In order to ha keep your horses with everything, you have to supplement. We found out the hard way. The Gregor and I, when we moved down to New Brunswick, and this is our heaven, it's gorgeous, we found out that it is, um, the selenium levels are low. I'd never ran into this in my entire career, um, and it was like, I had no idea, and it wasn't just because of the grass, and this is what people have to understand. It was the all round. It was a different grass mix. It was a different hay mix than what we're used to in Ontario. And I spend a small fortune in hay a year. I feed a lot of hay. I didn't once think, and I should have gone to get it tested, move into a new province. I did not. And there was consequences to that. But I've now learned what I need to do and what has to be done. And you have to know what the horse needs or what they might be lacking. You know, definitely throw mineral blocks out in the field. I have yet to get mine out because I have a horse who thinks that they're soccer balls. And we go back to that Ruby because she thinks it's a soccer ball. But I bring mine in every night. So it, it's really, it doesn't really matter what they're on in grass. It doesn't, it doesn't because mine come in the barn at night. So when you're dealing with pasture, you have it all set up that you want your pasture. Now you want to fence it. Now there's, Everybody in the world, as seen on the movies, would love to see the three-board fencing, nicely painted white or black. And you want to know something the reality is? They're expensive and it's high maintenance. And there's so many other viable options out there. There is cable wire. 
there is plastic, there is rubber, there's page wire with top board or without top board. Um, there is rubber uh, electric braid, electric rope. There's just so many options out there. And it doesn't matter which one you choose, as long as you choose one within your budget and one that's safe. We have a braided rope for, we have two braid rope, one electric on our field. I definitely have to do some um, kind of upgrades um, because it's not that it's not doing its job, it is, but I want something more. Now, what I'm going to do on our farm, me and Gregor have talked about it, is we actually only need one strand of electric. But I'm going to put two strands of quarter-inch rope. Bright yellow, bright, bright blue, doesn't really matter. And that's going to give them a nice visionary. Because if you can look at your fence, if you can't see that fence, nor can your horse. So when somebody comes and says... Oh, well, my horse doesn't respect the fence. You're looking at it, and it's either straight wire or it's pig wire. It's like, can you see it? No. Well, then they can't either. They don't have the greatest eyesight, especially not at distance. That's why you see a lot of um, hunter jumper. They make their jumps very white, red, something, something that the horse can see. I am vehemently against barbed wire for horses. For cattle, it is the only thing to use. But for horses, I am staunchly against any form of barbed wire at all. It is detrimental. If a horse goes through it, you're looking at stitches. You're looking at a mess. But you want to pick a fencing that if they do go through it, and let's face it, if you have livestock, you have loose livestock, that they're not going to get hurt and that it's easily repairable. Who wants to install a, spend $1,000 to fix a fence? So you stay within your budget, you stay within your means, but you stay at what's going to be best suited for you. If you have two or three horses that, you know, you've had all their lives and they're just out, you probably just go with one strand of ribbon and away you go. And there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing I would suggest is the posts. If you're going to put in steel posts, put the wire from the inside. I don't know why people put it on the outside. That doesn't make much sense to me. I can understand why you do it for cattle. Because you want it on the outside because then you can go ahead and fix the fence and can't be charged by cattle. I get that. But if you're going to do fencing, put it on the inside because it's going to provide more strength. That if a horse pushes up against it or runs into it, it's, the post is going to provide a bit more strength for you. And you just have to, you have to know what you want. And you have to know what's best for your horses. Every horse is different. And I have one mare over here, great little mare, um, outside 24-7. I'll tell you one thing, within two days, she sure likes coming into a stall every night. She thinks that's pretty cool. But I treat even outside horses. I treat them like they're my own. So we have the pasture done. Now gates. <laughs> this this is, this. I, I don't know why there's so much dissension about this. It's a gate. If it's a cedar pole pulled across, or if it's a pallet put on hinges, or if it's a steel gate, it's a gate, it's a gate. You want it minimally eight feet wide. That is the smallest you can go because that comfortably allows you to lead a horse through. You do not want to have to walk behind or ahead of a horse to get through a gate because somebody's going to get hurt, somebody's going to get kicked. So ideally, an eight foot gate is the minimum. I think we have 10 foot on ours. And it's, and then you have to decide, okay, if you're going to go out, can you get your tractor up? Now, that leads me to my next point. Maintenance of your pasture. Pasture is pasture. And everybody, a lot of people seem to think that, well, it's pasture. I don't have to do anything with it. But you do. If you have horses, you do. You have to, one, seed it down every three to four years. Not just a heavy seed, just a, a light overseed. And just to keep it rotating. But the most important thing you have to do in a pasture is you have to harrow it. And I know people are going, why? Horses are extremely scheduled. They will find a spot in the field and they will shit there. And then you got a big pile, which is called a hot spot. Horses will not eat around a hot spot because that's where they shit. They don't eat where they shit. 
And so you want to knock that out. You take out a set of harrows. Greg, in fact, made ours last year. I was so impressed. He made it out of a bed spring and I think a couple chains. It was cool. And I went, that is so innovative. But it was enough to get out and break up those piles. Because once you break them up, they then become a fertilizer for the field. But then there's no hot spots because the more hot spots you get on your pasture, the less value your pasture is becoming. And then you get, if you don't have any grass and you just have hot spots, then you're looking at, uh, you're looking at, you know, mosquitoes, flies, uh, West Nile, and just a variety of other things that's just not healthy. You don't have to have great pasture, but if you maintain it, it'll look the best. And harrowing is whether it even be just a, a set of arena harrows, um, a set of chain harrows, either or just something that you can go running around that field on a four-wheeler, knocking up those piles and taking out those hot spots and fertilizing it as you go. It will benefit you and give you the full value of your pasture. And next thing is, in the fall, if you have spots that are well, hot spots or just something they did, is get somebody in and either take a lawnmower or a bush hog, mow it down, and fall's the best time to do that because then you can put the field to bed. And you take the you take the bush hog, you get everything mowed down nice, and then you can throw some grass seed on it for there, or you get it all harrowed. So by spring, you're not going to have any hot spots. You're going to get a nice even pasture may not be you know may not be high or anything but you're going to get a nice even pasture and that's what you want you're not going to get the fresh uh heavy grass that you have to worry about founder and when you're seeding your field is don't use a hay mix go to your feed dealer it's what we do and you ask for a horse pasture mix it's not heavy in clover, alfalfa, timothy. What it is, it's got like orchard grass. It's got fescues in it, maybe a touch of timothy. I'm not a fan of clover and pasture. Because it's not that they need to do it. Horses are grazers. They're going to graze on whatever's out there. But you don't want it heavy because then you, you're just overloading them and it's not healthy. So you have to, and that goes under knowing what your horse needs and what he doesn't need. A lot of people have dry lots and where there is no grass or their horse has found her before and can't have grass. And you just make sure that it doesn't matter if you give them grass or not, they have to be able to eat. So I'm not a fan of putting horses out with muzzles. I understand people do. <clears throat> but in my opinion, even if you give them a half a bale of hay to kick around for the day, at least they're eating because a horse needs to, they need to constantly eat because that's how their guts work. And you just have to understand what it is. And you, when it comes to pasture, you don't have to have a big pasture. You don't have to have uh, something. You just have to have one that's maintained. And anybody can do it. Anybody can go out and take a little half acre field and go out and harrow it. And I'll tell you, their pasture look better than the next ones. It's just... It's, it's called maintenance, and it really needs to get done. So then we have where, I don't know why people get crazy about barns. It's like, oh my God, it's just a barn for God's sakes. People seem to think that this is the way a barn has to be made, and there's certain restrictions. No, there's not. There really isn't. I've seen shacks of barns where I'm kind of walking up going, is it safe to walk in? And walked into beautiful stalls, spacious, bedded down, happy horses. I walked into Million Dollar Burn. I wouldn't let glassy piss on paper in them. They're just, it's, it's kind of where you're coming from. You walk into a, a hunter jumper barn, you usually get the 12, 14 foot walkways. You get the full doors, 12 by 12 stalls. And that's good for them. That's entirely up to them. That works for them, but that's not the, what I want to see when I walk into a barn. You go into a lot of standard bred barns, we use a lot of stall gates. We like our horses out. Horses are very social. We like the horse's heads out and kind of bopping around, and we usually have 10, 12-foot walkways because we got to be able to fit a jogger and a race bike in it. And tack boxes, we're big on tack boxes out front, so 
you know, that's a standard bread barn. That's a working barn. And then you have, you know, a, a small barn is, uh, I went into a barn in Michigan once and I kind of, I went in, I, uh, who knows what I was doing there. I was out bopping around and I look in the stalls. I said, what are you betting with? He goes, sand. I said, why? Hmm, it's there. I said, is it hard to maintain? He goes, no, you just got to rake it out every day and yeah, it's fine. They're out most of the time. Anyways, it was like, huh. I would never have thought of that, but it, that worked for him. I, I would rather ask a question than to judge. So you get to the point where it depends on what your horse is doing. Now, like I said, hunter jumper barns, warm blood barns, standard bread barns, thoroughbred barns, they're working barns. So they, their horses are in more than they're out. So you definitely want like a 10 by 10 stall minimally. Um, if not a 12 by 12, because they are in more than they're not. And that's okay. You want them to be able to walk around. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not required for every horse. Um, you, I have, uh, ideally for me, the way I grew up, a 10 by 10 stalls. Great. You know, I've seen barns with 8 by 8 stalls. I've seen barns with standing stalls, 10 standing stalls. It was a beautiful sight. Standing stalls was the norm 50, 60 years ago. Everybody was in, especially the heavy horses. Is And the Mennonites still use them, and I respect them for that, is, you know, they go out the field, but when they come in, they're, they're putting a standing stall, or in some cases, just a cow stanchion. And it's good because the horse learns to be tied. They can lay down. They can get up. They have everything they need. But it teaches them proximity to other horses. It teaches them respect of other horses. And you don't get that kicking and squealing. Um, because horses are social animals and they're herd animals. So no matter where they are, they're gonna wanna they're gonna wanna figure that out. So I've seen a barn with standing stalls and just loved it. Uh, in fact, in a, in a few years, I do fully intend to put in five or six standing stalls just because it's good for them to learn, especially babies. And then we have the box stall. It's like, like I said, ideally mine are, I would like them all 10 by 10. My barn is not set up like that. My barn has, I think, I think Gregor, when he made the barn and he made our stalls by himself, I think he made them all a different size because of the way the barn was set up. So some are 10 by 10, some are 10 by 12, some are eight by eight, you know, some are eight by seven. You know, it's, it's not that it's wrong because they come in, they're safe and carry on. It's, but it, it's so a dissension in the horse industry saying you got to do this, this, and this. No, you don't. You got to do with what's in your budget, within your means, and how you can handle it. There is no set way to house horses per se. You know, if you want to make a barn out of pallets or ocean containers and cut them out, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, the only thing I say is hard set. It's got to be minimally seven feet high because a horse gets, a horse should be able to lift his head up comfortably. That's the only restriction I have. But if you choose to go with half doors, full doors, full walls, half walls, you know, pallets, gates, it's whatever suits you and your horses. I can assure you, if you get a new horse in that's used to full walls and you put them in a gated stall, there's going to be a lot of kicking and squealing, but they will adapt. Broodmares are the wonderful thing about broodmares. You can put them just about anywhere, but it's, it's whatever works for what you are doing with your horses. And that's something that is a judgment call. There is no set way. There is no, there is no, this is what you must do. And when the keyboard warriors get yipping off about that, it's like, I'm thinking, where are you getting this shit from? Do it however way you need to. If you don't like it, don't come. You know, and the same goes with cement floors to dirt floors. Um, I have cement floors in my barn. I do not like dirt floors um, because dirt floors are harder to maintain. And a lot of people have dirt floors and don't maintain them. You got to put stone dust in every year or two. You got to level them out. And 
I like my cement floor. It just, it's what I like. I like my cement floor. I've had asphalt. I've had dirt. I've had interlocking brick. I just go to the cement. But some people are hard pressed. Well, you have to in order to keep their feet. It's like, what do you think their feet are made of? Glass? Like, you don't, your horse isn't going to get lame standing on a cement floor. He's going to get lame because you're doing something stupid. Or he's doing something stupid. But there's been no direct cause, to my knowledge, of lameness being attributed to just because of cement stall. I've never heard of it. I've never had experienced it in my entire career. But that's a judgment call, too. If I choose to have cement stalls and somebody comes along and says, well, you're being cruel to your horses, I'm going to say what I usually say. When you start paying my hay bill to the tune of about ten grand a year, you can tell me what to do. And people have opinions when they shouldn't. It's always better that if you're going into something you don't know, is ask why they're doing it. You know, ask, you know, what, why did you do this? And they're going to answer you. It doesn't make you stupid for asking. It makes you willing to learn and willing to accept there are many different ways to doing horses. And there's many different ways to house them. Then they have the outdoor shelters. I have friends that run their horses out 24-7. These horses look spectacular. It's just like, whoa. I keep I bring mine in at night, but that doesn't mean everybody has to. Everybody, there's some that run them out. The statement I hate the most, and I think is completely idiotic, horses prefer to be outside. Hmm. Horses don't have that kind of thought process, for one. For two, they learn by repetition. And for three, they will adapt to making their schedule to what's being handed to them. I can assure you with 100% certainty that at 7 o'clock when my hubby comes home and his truck pulls in, there's nine horses at the gate. They will run you down to get to their stalls. But if that horse is used to being outside, they're not going to come to the gate. They're going to wait for you to walk their feet out to them. It, it's all a matter of what you have assigned for them to schedule themselves to. They don't have, horses don't have the, the thought process to say, well, today, um, yeah, today I'm going to stay outside because I just want to piss off my owner. All they're looking at is food, pasture, running around, stall. You know, they go with what they've been taught. And it's, people try to humanize horses, which I can understand why they do it. I still think it's funny, but horses don't have the human emotions that we like to assign to them. Um, they don't have the thought process to think something through as an idea and then put it forward. They, they don't have that. They have flight or fight. They have safe or unsafe. They have food or no food. You know, it's very black and white um, and you know, to humanize, I understand why it's being done, but it doesn't mean that's the answer, you know, and a lot of people are going to say, well, my horse feels, your horse, you probably don't even know your horse. I have 15 of them, and I can assure you, I screw up just like everybody else, but I, and mine drive me crazy, they get loose, they go running down the road, I had two go to Coldstream, it was like, well, isn't that just cool, and but they don't think about it. They just, they take the opportunity. And you have to sit back and say, okay, why? Because horses will be horses. Horses can be absolute sweethearts and they can be little shits where you just want to look at them and kill them. And that's never going to change. And nothing you do is going to change that. They're going to have good days. They're going to have bad days. But what the industry needs to do is respect the many different version of what's right for that person that has horses. There is no right or way. And anybody says there's a right or wrong can really shut up. You know, if you want to go spend $5 million on everything you think is expected of you, waste your money. Carry on. But that doesn't mean I have to. And it all goes down to, in my opinion, 
What is convenient for you? What is expected of your horse? What is your working area like? And what is cost effective? We all have to do things on a budget. We can't, as much as we would like to throw money out, we have to do things within our means. And I cannot stress enough. If as a horse owner, you are keeping your horse safe, happy, fed, trained, you're doing it right. I don't care if it's in a standing stall, box stall, running shed, a round pen, it doesn't matter. Do what's right for you and do what's right for your horse and your expectation. It's going to work itself out in the long run. But you just have to realize there is no set way to doing it. There's the safe way, there's the unsafe way, and that's about as black and white as you're going to get. But research it. There are tons of ideas on the internet on how to build stalls, what is stalls best suited for you, um, what kind of barn, what kind of pasture, what kind of fencing. Research it. You know, don't have somebody say, well, this is what has to be done. It's like, yeah, right. Okay, carry on. Do your research. Do your homework. <coughs> and you will figure it out. But do what's best for you, not what's expected. Because if you start trying to live up to expectations, you're going to fail. And who wants to fail? I want everybody to succeed. Well, that's my rant on barns and pastures. Stay tuned for next week.